It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 258 at block height 672,611 on Sunday, February 28th. So, it's just you and me today, Fud. Yeah, good day to be alone in the Block Digest studio. Here's a question, though. How do I know that's really you? Well, obviously. Actually... How do you know it's really me? Because, dude, you know, I, I hear Tom Cruise is running around on TikTok now. Not sure what to believe anymore. No, doing, that's doing me, magic. actually. Yeah, that's, that's me. I just like to let everybody know that right now. So you're Tom Cruise? I can be Tom Cruise or anybody else you'd like me to be. That's not creepy. It helps get the ladies until you tell them about it. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, if anybody hasn't seen this somehow yet, um, like they, there are like three different, almost flawless deep fakes, both visually and audio of Tom Cruise floating around uh, on, on, on TikTok. Like th- this is weird. Like if, if I had not first seen that with something going, here we go with deep fakes. I would have been like, what? Tom Cruise is on TikTok? Yep. There's, uh, there's no way I could tell to know that that isn't Tom Cruise. It, it'd be even more fun if, say, you had three different ages of Tom Cruise together. Uh, yeah. But amazingly yeah. lifelike. Just uh, at a surreal quote. Kind of glitching a little at the end of the sentences there. You, you got some VPN lag going or something? I might. Just for the audience's knowledge, during this slight break in the recording, I was actually running a thorough social security number-based background check to make sure I am, in fact, sitting here with BTC FUD and not Tom Cruise or Kim Jong-un or anyone else. Oh, yeah. You're definitely sitting here with Tom Cruise, buddy. Does that mean Adam Townsend likes me now? I think that means we've stepped in to Adam Curridus's described world. You know, you, you really can't trust anything you see with your eyes or hear over the internet anyway. And I can't wait until we kind of have the, the inverse of face ID, uh, whatever that is, that just makes our face appear however we care it's for it to. A little 3D hologram that sits on top of my face that makes me purdy. I mean, dude, I'm just thinking weird. Like, you know, the the whole thing that worried me during Trump was the potential of, like, some crazy thing people would believe Trump would do. Being just dispersed out there and consequences dominoing. Now under Biden, it's like, think about how much more you could exaggerate his senility. Yeah, the ability to shape narrative is unsurpassed. And I don't know quite where we're at on how we actually validate that it's a fake. Um, Because now we have a news media that is perfectly happy to completely ignore stories, uh, sometimes when they're about the vice president's own son, uh, because supposedly the data involved, uh, was not properly attained, whatever that is. I, I haven't heard too many newspaper people make that argument for any other story ever, but, uh, evidently now we're at that place. So it, it kind of leads to these interesting endpoints of anybody can say that anything happened and create uh, what looks like valid proof of that. And then anybody can say anything didn't happen based on the proof 
not being valid. And it, you inject this need of a time lag for some authority figure to validate that for you. But if everybody providing this information is not trustworthy to begin with, or you start to believe that they're just presenting you the information to shape whatever they want to tell you or what they want you to think about it, then you truly feel lost in the woods. You, you've got no real signposts out there in the world. And I, I don't know where that leaves us in a digital sense. I hope it means that we can at least see the real world around us as one thing maybe, and the metaverse is something different. I don't think so. I mean, I look around at how hyper polarized shit is and how willing to just establish your own sets of facts different tribes are. And it's just like, nope, we have officially crossed the Rubicon where anything can be legitimate or total bullshit based on how that arbitrarily fits into what you want to believe and that is like we, we're at the point where the tools are undeniably out there and good enough to do that to every scale except the shit you see in here on a specific block in a specific building somewhere with your own eyes and ears and that's it everything else gradually becomes a fog of war yeah, I, I think it's very hard to hold differing views of the world in your head and, and not get stuck in one or the other as far as how you're viewing it. So I, I'm trying to figure out how unprecedented or not unprecedented this is, um, because I just imagine information flow, say, 2000 years ago would have been fairly limited and you would have had to wonder how you could trust what was coming in there there definitely would have been the ability for rumors to spread and not really be verifiable in real time right so i don't i don't know how unprecedented of a situation it is in terms of some of the the time factors and the need for resolution on what really happened somewhere but the ability to doctor evidence uh, to support whatever you want to have supported is just amazing with this new tech stack we've got. Yeah. I mean, like through most of the 20th century, it was like, yeah, you could play some games, but it was mostly framing or context. It was just stupidly expensive to outright fabricate believable things. And even as technology developed, it still stayed stupidly expensive. And the more the ability for normal people to record things, like there was that brief period where it's like, we can go verify things because of all, like how wide the dragnet of shit being caught up and digitally recorded was. And because the cost to believably fuck with that was still too high. But it's like, you know, look back to um, Rogue One, the Star Wars movie where they had the deep fake Princess Leia at the end and deep fake Grand Moff Tarkin for a big chunk of that movie. Completely obvious at a first glance, it was manipulated imagery. Completely obvious. And that was a major company specializing in like modeling and manipulation of imagery like that now you have tom cruise on TikTok. i couldn't tell the difference if i wasn't told at first yeah i i think we've always had to deal with this in tech stack and i think you know we've got plenty of precedents with the cia and others um and their mastery of tech stack long doing this i mean uh, if I'm remembering right, when the Zapruder film first surfaced, somebody had messed with ordering of some frames in there. And, you know, there were only so many groups that could probably convincingly do that at that time. And we, we've evolved till now with all sorts of that sort of thing being possible. But now you can paint a picture of reality that's so immersive nobody would question it unless 
you know, told to question it. So, yeah, brave new world, man. Yep. And I think you have another parallel um, track in that brave new world to go through before we get into the crypto y stuff. Yeah, this one's fun, uh, similar. Uh, so, according to the New York Post, the New York City Police Department is now fielding what they call a digi dog. Uh, the digi dog appears to be a Boston Dynamics robot, uh, Spot, and uh, appears to have uh, a camera stack on top of it. Uh, I didn't go out and invalidate that by looking at their website, but that's what they claim the capabilities are, lights and cameras. Uh, but the little guy is about 70 pounds, cute as hell, and uh, trumping all over New York City, uh, in tests anyway. So they claim he can run about three and a half miles per hour. Uh, I haven't looked on the manufacturer's site. That's an interesting number to me because... A human walking fairly quickly would be walking at three and a half, four miles an hour. So it makes me wonder if it's easy to outrun a digi dog. Uh, but the video they share here um, just shows some guys, three guys. I think it's one guy to control, two guys to wrestle it to the ground and kill it if it's required. Um, walking around uh, their digi dog in New York. So they're they're testing her out a little bit, making sure this this digi dog can walk straight and all that um i've seen similar videos for offshore oil rigs where companies are demoing engineers walking one of these boston dynamic spots around that have sensor arrays on them and the dogs can do things like sniff pipes for um leaks and that sort of thing or uh, some of them use little arm uh, to put a camera up and read a sensor that generally a person would have to go read uh, so they're looking at making it much easier for somebody to remotely teleoperate the dog uh, to go do something that otherwise somebody would have had to been flown in be on the platform maybe a specialist in the thing they're trying to solve uh, and that sort of thing uh, to go look at a specific problem. So, uh, yeah, we are getting to a point where it looks like the robot dogs will enter society. I'm specifically interested in the police um, walking around in a city. Yeah. I don't know if they watched the Dark Mirror episode, but a lot of people have. And... Uh, I don't know how they could help but think about it. Well, I'm just interested in two aspects mainly. Um, one, the information that thing could be scooping up wandering around. And then two, how quickly is this going to be shown to be economically not viable right now because your super expensive robot dog keeps getting smashed and broken? Yeah. So uh, again, I I haven't looked recently, but... I think last time I priced these dogs out, if you want a full stack, it was around 275 grand. Um, this is not absolutely every option, but I'm sure that's over 100 grand in hardware right there and probably a lot more effort, right? So if uh, digi dogs start getting abducted the way Lady Gaga's dogs get abduct abducted, you know, it, it would probably put a dent into somebody's budget over there. Well, like, dude, you could put Imsy catchers on that, packet sniffers, um, cameras linked in with facial recognition, and all of that can get correlated to like the crazy granular degree of this dog knows exactly where it is on the street and who just walked past it and what the signal strengths for different things were. Like, <laughs> yeah, that thing could have a variety of noses that are just as good as dog noses, but for different things. So you're, you're completely correct. And I think people have shown all sorts of stuff you can do with equipment you might find on eBay, as far as say scanning an area's passports via RFID tags, um, anything wireless, anything to do with cell phones. You could put a, a stingray right on the back of one of those guys and start going and grabbing phone calls mobily um the sky is really the limit with that platform yep so and watch out for digital i mean it, that's just like fucking terrifying to think about dude 
and you know especially um as someone brought up when we were talking about this uh upstairs the other day um is smashing robo dog attacking a police officer legally it'll be interesting to see i mean to me that's defacing police equipment of some sort and i'm sure there's plenty of fines associated with that but i'm, well, I'm sure you've heard of people getting in serious trouble for defending themselves from a police dog well how good will robo dog be at respecting property lines yeah and when will the person running robot dogs say, oh, no, we can't do that, though we have the capability to do that. Mm. Alrighty, though. We want to get into the main news, sir? Oh, yeah. Fire away. After two years of hilarious bullshit and back and forth and yada yada, Hey, guess what? The New York Attorney General's office just settled um, with Tether and iFinex, um, who will pay $18.5 million. Why? I don't know. Um, because they were found of no criminal or fraudulent wrongdoing at all. Oh, and also the entire $850 million loan that Bitfinex took from the Tether reserves after the crypto capital shenanigans where the U.S. government themselves seized the money that they tried suing Finax and Tether over for not having. Um, yeah, that loan's been paid back. <laughs> and pretty much, um, yeah, found no wrongdoing, um, paying $18.5 million in what I would refer to as extortion. And the only real changes coming out of this are no more doing business in New York for Tether or any Finex derivative or um, subsidiary. And Tether is going to be releasing quarterly statements on its reserves, um, specifically the percentage component of what's actually making up the reserve pile. So yeah, um, two years screaming, market manipulation, printing tethers out of thin air. Um, they did nothing wrong, paid that loan to tether back, um, and are going to be even more transparent than they already were. <laughs> it's not every day you get to see the U.S. government just completely, utterly fail at attacking an integral piece of this space um, so publicly. <laughs> well... I personally appreciate that they uh, conceded or said that they would show their reserves. Um, I think that's great. Um, people have wanted to see that for quite a while now. And you know what? If you want to be taken seriously, there you go. That's a very easy way to kill a lot of fun. So uh, thank you, Tether, for doing that. But see, that's the funny thing. Like th This sounds like it's going to be a little more detailed than previously. But they have made periodic attestations with third parties attesting to it about their reserves, um, about the amount of reserves, um, for as long as they have existed. That just magically wasn't good enough for Tether. Like USDC doing that, fine. Other stablecoin doing that, fine. But Tether, that's not an audit. That's not a, a reporting statement. So it's like really they're just doing the same thing except more regularly and in a slightly more detailed way it seems maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to be the the eldest child and or the one that goes foreign, you know. Tether's native. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've been paying attention to this since this started back in 2019 and yeah. <laughs> Lol. Yep. Everybody gets a win. Congrats, New York. I hope you put two feathers in your hat for this piece of work right here. Golf clap. But I think next up we have um, have a little interesting uh, thingy with a bank relating yeah. to Coinbase. I think this one's fun. So a bank called Vast Bank in Tulsa, Oklahoma, has uh, supposedly become the first bank in the United States to offer accounts denominated in Bitcoin. Um, that's way more than a golf clap from me. Uh, 
we were talking about the potential of this happening someday, and it seems like someday was this past week. So Vast Bank evidently got a hold of an institutional Coinbase account and uh, decided to start poking around with the APIs over there and made a little system uh, where they can use Coinbase's uh, institutional storage facilities. And I'm looking through here for the second API set. I'm not going to find it. Supposedly they're using two of Coinbase's uh, products here and have woven them together uh, along with their own software for a front end. Uh, to make this possible for them to do Bitcoin custody on behalf of their clients. Uh, it's really neat. Um, I think it's fun because community banks oftentimes uh, do their own uh, internal uh, software processes to provide web access and internal services to themselves. And it is awesome that uh, smaller bank they say 744 million assets uh out of oklahoma uh, was the first one to come along and do this i think a lot of other banks will probably follow their lead and if i had to guess coinbase will figure this out and make a white label product that makes it much easier uh, for the vast majority who come later to get into this sort of custody arrangement on behalf of their cl banking clients insert re about mic distance but um yeah i think i would be very remiss to not go god damn it why did it have to be coinbase um why couldn't it be anybody but coinbase like come on because it's like th this kind of connection between things was like it was obviously inevitable but like for fuck's sake, does it have to be fucking Coinbase? Like really? Well, Coinbase is the big big gorilla in the market and maybe has been doing it about as long as anybody. But at this point, we have a lot of great custodians out there for Bitcoin, I think. I think Fidelity could be in the running for this. Jim and I could be in the running for this. I've heard State Street. Uh, you know, the banks like BNY Mellon uh, will in the future be in the running for this. Uh, I think we're just right at the beginning of what's going to happen in this type of market where banks figure out that Bitcoin offers them a revenue stream that they don't really have anymore running on low interest. Yeah, lets them get out there. Yeah, but that's kind of the come on because I, I think you're entirely on point here that Coinbase will white label and try to make this easier, which means they're going to have momentum when this starts happening. They're going to have the reputation. They're going to be the guys that clean house off the first wave. And it's just like, God damn it. Like once Coinbase plugs into that type of legacy shit like that, like <laughs> I, I don't know. The idea of delete Coinbase becomes hopeless to me at that point. Well, where where should we on this? Because eventually the alternative is going to be working with JP Morgan or somebody on this, I, I assume. And it kind of depends on how fast Coinbase and the others run to get started. And uh, there there are another of uh, there are many more institutional custody providers out there now than there were a couple of years ago. And I think their penetration is getting deeper also. So sure, there's going to be options. Uh, I, maybe one of the questions is, wouldn't we rather have Coinbase be doing it than the legacy banking system? <sighs> Yeah, as little as I like Coinbase, you know what? They're not the legacy banking system yet. They're pretty fucking Yep, this is something we'll have to keep an eye on as uh, grandmas begin to buy Bitcoins at the bank. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, though. Real deep dig time. Oh, yeah. This, this like, I, I didn't even really do more than glance through this. Um, and that was enough to make me cringe. So I should have made detailed notes on this, but I can walk you through the conceptual ideas uh, very easily for what this story talks about. So somebody, let's see, I want to attribute this. 
Let's see, bishopfox.com, labs.bishopfox.com. So I'm gonna guess Bishop Fox published a very interesting piece analyzing JSON parser inconsistencies. Wow, I mean, that's hard hitting right there, right? So what are we even talking about here? Let's see, at the root of many internet applications of today is data that's flowing all over the place. So when, when you log in and use whatever your favorite service is, whether it's Twitter or YouTube or whatever, they're gonna send back a whole bunch of data to that front end uh, to configure things for you. Or when you're checking out through your favorite online store, uh, you're gonna pass around a lot of data about what you wanna order, you know, what credit card do I wanna use, all these types of things. Well, the dominant internet data standard right now is called JSON. Uh, there have been others in the past and inside of niches, there's all sorts of different ways you can do this. JSON is fun because it's human readable. Uh, so you can put variable names in there and uh, a human can kind of parse the structure just by looking at it. It's not a binary form where it's just ones and zeros or hex characters, whatever, that doesn't mean too much to somebody looking at it. Uh, it can actually be something you can comprehend by looking at it. And JSON also has an additional side effect of being valid data for the JavaScript programming language. So this is the native way, well, this is a native way that objects can be in JavaScript. So, okay, here's what we're dealing with. We've got JavaScript, which has come in many different flavors over time. And then we've got JSON, uh, which has many different programs that rely on it and many different parsers that cut it up when it comes in and figure out what it is essentially when it comes in. So we're passing around data and all, everybody looking at the data has to agree on what the data is. This is kind of like rolling up versions and doing softworks in Bitcoin. Uh, you kind of have to agree on the valid ways to talk to each other about things. And that's what the parsing spec is in JSON. Okay, so that was a lot of tea up. I'm sorry if that was too much. Uh, so what we're talking about here is inconsistencies in how these objects get decoded on various layers of the stack and using various libraries to parse. And there are reasons that at different times, people have made decisions to allow either looser um, interpretations of what's considered valid or stricter interpret interpretations of what's considered valid. And kind of at the root of it all is people did not want to take things that were considered valid previously and make them invalid. And by allowing that, they didn't make a very tight spec on the data and or how to handle the data more specifically that was coming in, how to interpret it. And therefore we have a whole lot of different behaviors around how to deal with data. So if you have an object in JavaScript, JavaScript is key value based when, it, I'm sorry, JSON is key value based when you're passing around objects. So if I have a really basic object, um, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's something that's supposed to represent me and there's a variable in there and it's called height. And it says, okay, you're so many centimeters tall. It's, it's a number that is the height. And we just know that that number is going to be in centimeters. One of the interesting things about the JSON spec is in all that data about me, I might have a height, I might have a birthday, I might have an eye color, like think about things that would be on my driver's license. I might have all those properties, but what happens when I tell you, you know, I'm, I'm a hundred and some centimeters tall. And then later, in that same data object, I tell you now my height is 200 centimeters. I'm, I'm a pretty big guy. Well, that's one example of something that the JSON RFC spec does not address. Which of those two keys that are called height actually represent me? Which one is correct? So 
different parsers take different approaches to this, or I should say they have different behaviors. Um, some would say that first key is the correct key. Some say the second key is the correct key. Um, if you were actually validating that, some might reject it, some might accept it. So that key, um, that secondary key in there can be used to attack systems. Uh, because perhaps on the front end at the UI where I'm using a web browser, I make one of these objects and then I decide to attack the back end by putting in a second key, say. And if I know the way various layers in the back end will interpret me adding that second key, what specific behaviors I'll get out of parsers at different layers, I can attack the back end by putting in numbers that may not make sense for correct behavior and maybe should have been validated up the stack, but haven't been. Uh, they give a really great example of a web shopping cart and how you might attack this uh, if there are specific layers like Go underneath uh, other layers, be they Node or Java, and you're given an object by your front end. Uh, it's really fascinating, geeky stuff to read through if you're a software engineer. Uh, I highly recommend it for everybody. Um, I, I could go into another uh, interesting thing or two in there if you like. Yeah, I just think at the the high level though, like pretty much just if you can figure out which interpreter something is using to pass JSON around, which a lot of stuff, even Bitcoin stuff does, and screw with that, you can get unexpected behavior or potentially get returned information that you're not supposed to have access to or et cetera. Like you, you can just trick the thing into doing the wrong thing when it gets that data and that's one of the most common ways to move data around between things yep definitely true and this guy is profiling something like 40 different parsers that are very commonly used in these scenarios and his example is ordering something via a web shopping cart and how you could show a positive quantity to the middle layer that does all the receipt calculation, but then have a negative uh, quantity come up for the back end that actually does the billing. So you could trick a system into not getting billed for items that then ship. So it's it's fascinating stuff to look at he does know that you do have to know the specific implementations used by a system to really attack this well um, so this is a type of thing that may be an internal software architect that understood the whole stack could exploit um, so i imagine places it, it's kind of like mm, wanted to say evil made attack, but it's closer to an evil engineer attack. Sometimes you see uh, tricky things you can do in C with pointers and that sort of thing. And they actually have a contest every year for the obfuscated C contest. What can you hide in a piece of straightforward looking code? Uh, so if you actually knew all of the different parsers getting used at the different lists, you would actually be able to attack it much better for an inside job than an outside job perhaps uh, but he's pointing out that not having a standard leads to undefined behavior or just purely not good behavior in some cases mm -hmm. and you know given how that is one of the most widely used data things on the internet like yeah that's um it's really keeping with the trend the last few years of big vulnerabilities that get found are massive in terms of the attack space they open up. It really is. And it's it's a big deal. Uh, I, I think it also comments on how having a lack of standard ultimately leads to confusion and vulnerabilities. Um, things like the way different parsers represent the value infinity in that system. Uh, can lead to things breaking. It'll it'll do things like turn a number object into a string uh, that says infinity in some parser cases, which is weird all by itself. Uh, another fun thing in there was as 
any programmer will tell you it would be kind of nice in JavaScript to be able, or in JSON objects to be able to inject comments in line. So you can say things about the structure of it and then have that documented in your code base or in a reference object while still, say, using that object in the real world. And one of the vulnerabilities that snuck in here was some of those parsing systems allow you to do that, to put in those comments, but then other parsing systems may treat those comments differently when you start throwing them around. And some of the really interesting attacks were variables that were defined inside of those comments that read like valid code, and then various systems that would strip the comments and then those uh, variables would be exposed to the back end. That one, uh, that one was definitely a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So what's the lessons, kids? Everything is broken. Be careful and validate your JSON to the best of your ability. Alrighty. So are we ready to get into some lightning autism? Let's do it. So Lucas uh, Almier, um, Pedro Moreno Sanchez, Aniket Kate, and Mateo Mafe, um, all from different uh, academic institutions, have proposed um, Blitz, a new scheme for atomically routing payments over uh, payment channel networks. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep this as absolutely succinct as possible. So if you really want to dive through the paper, um, they do kind of piecemeal walk through like the bad minimum design and then adding things to eventually get to the design proposal itself. I'm just going to skip to the end there. But pretty much the, the way a conventional HTLC works right now is like I send money to Tina who sends money to you know, American HODL, who then sends money to you, FUD. And the idea is that each of those hops are atomically um, completed if you roll the pre-image all the way back to me. And if you don't, everything times out. But the thing is, my time lock has to be, say, four. The one between... Um, Tina and HODL has to be three and the one between you and HODL has to be two because this has to work itself out so that if um, that pre-image was released by you but something went wrong in the middle there needs to be enough time for the person you gave it to American HODL to actually put that on chain so the rest of everyone else can see the pre-image and then know, okay, this finalized instead of letting it get refunded. And whoever is stuck with the malicious party can, you know, settle things on chain properly. But each like step going back to the sender has to have a longer time lock than the one ahead of it. And so kind of what, what this design is trying to do is, um, you know, one of the core things is try to remove the need to do that so that every hop can have the same time lock. And so they're kind of tweaking things um, so that the refund has to be initiated by um, the guy sending the payment. And the confirmation of the payment, it just kind of is there by default. So instead of using a hash lock, what you would do is one path is literally just the coins go through all the way, and the other is the timeout. But the trick with the timeout is I make a new transaction um, that has nothing to do with my lightning channel, and I make an output for every person along the path in the payment, and their refund transaction um, spends their input from, from my special transaction here as one of the inputs to their refund transaction. And so this way, um, pretty much nobody can refund anything unless I actively do something on chain um, to 
create these outputs that are part of their refund transaction. You know what I mean? By default, this just goes through. And to kind of deal with privacy issues here, um, all those special outputs um, for those nodes are stealth addresses, kind of like how um, the PayNIMS um, and BIP47 work in the Samurai implementation. And then from here, um, pretty much um, you have that time lock now for the whole payment route. The absolute time lock, like this specific block, is the exact same block for every hop in the payment. But you add a CSV time lock so that you can cover the case um, of you know, just a communication going wrong. Like let's say somebody goes to chain to refund it, but the payment actually completed. That relative time lock um, kind of adds another time lock, like a second one for the refund transaction that would allow everybody to, you know, confirm um, the payment success transaction um, before that, that refund occurs. And so, um, like it's definitely an interesting design in terms of like by default everything goes through and this concept of the sender actually has to initiate something for anyone's refund transactions to be valid but you know really you do this at the requirement that every person routing payments on lightning is now expected to have this special output on chain that they can always make the the refund dependency transaction with and then you also make um any refund that hits chain way bigger because the sender has to make this massive transaction with an output for every hop in the payment and like you know what i mean we could potentially get to the point where we're trimming communication rounds with things like adapter signatures on schnorr and you wouldn't get the benefit of everybody's time lock period stays the same. But I mean, is it really worth that gain with all the extra complexity of a stealth address setup communications for that, this massive transaction to trigger a refund? You know what I mean? So it, it's kind of one of those things like it solves one problem but it, it potentially creates other issues. And so it's like, is that worth the trade-off in terms of do this with everything? Bitcoin just trade-offs all day long. Yeah. But I mean, the nice thing about layers like Lightning Network is there is no fucking global consensus. <laughs> so you know what I mean? People could use this if they want. People could use conventional HTLCs if they want. They can use adapter signatures built on Schnorr when that's deployed. Like it's all just opt into your own consensus between the peers who want to share that with you. But like, you know, look, looking at this design, it's a useful trade off and tweak with things. But I personally would not be rushing to use a channel like this. I think it's great because the highway's out there. And the question is, what sort of vehicle should we build to run on the highway? And the DOT, not really around. So we're going to get some pretty weird looking vehicles along the way. Hopefully most of them are safe for their passengers and uh, other players. Uh, but luckily your vehicle, my vehicle, though they run on the same highway, they're kind of ephemeral to each other, right? If I'm bicycling and you're riding in a car, that's fine. Totally work. We're not even messing with each other. Mm -hmm. and I, I think like the, the one positive about this, because like th this makes me think back to like the symmetric channel design. Um, where it's still based on penalizing old states, but both sides of the channel have the same pre-signed transaction instead of their own different version of it. And it's like, you know, e even trade-offs involved, it's just the fact that academics are poking around in this space to this degree that they're completely decomposing the different levels of these second layer protocol stacks and they're just playing with pieces you know what i mean yep and as you get knowledgeable about your pieces or you just get more read legos you're going to build more interesting things later yep speaking of building interesting things later though oh this is an interesting thing right now 
Yeah, so Shirt Bits did a fucking super drop um, this last week. Um, they have released um, the Oracle Explorer. So, like, think of it as a block explorer for oracles. Um, anybody can go there, set up a bet to be an oracle for. Um, you know, anybody can go there to find um, oracle settlements or sign statements. And, um, you know, long term, people can get to see the reputation of oracles. So, th this kind of solves three major problems around DLCs. Um, like how do you coordinate to, to match users with oracles and like rate the trustworthiness of oracles. So like th this is just a, a slam dunk in terms of generalized infrastructure, um, to really play with DLCs. Like there's this, um, company atomic finance, they kind of pivoted from ETH smart contract bullshit to, um, start building a DLC platform on Bitcoin. But like their setup last I checked, it was, I think they were only supporting like um, enumerated bets for like the data an election bet. Um, but it was a real lockdown, like everything's happening through the web platform. This is literally just open. Anybody can do enumerated like numerical bets, um, just paste in their conditions and shit. It's, it's way more flexible in terms of what oracles and users can do. And it's like, that's exactly what the hell is needed here. And on top of that, to go along with the Oracle Explorer, they have dropped an app called Crystal Bull, which is pretty much just a real simple app to generate Oracle keys and identities, um, sign and create bets to go paste that into the Oracle Explorer for people to find. And then when the... Um, contract has expired for you to actually sign the outcomes and paste that on the Oracle Explorer so that they can actually, um, like users who did that contract can go find what they need to settle it. So like this is kaboom. I see gambling problems aplenty for the rest of the bull market. This seems like a really good starter kit. Uh, because they've recognized the challenges associated with oracles and uh, why should you uh, trust any given random uh, oracle out there? And they've kind of brought it in to a trust environment. They built some tools uh, that allow people to start playing with this. And I think that is the way I would contextualize it. They're giving people a starting point to actually um, build the next layers on top of. And I'm sure this will increment. I'm sure other things like this that are broader will come by, uh, but this lets people start playing with and you know just making silly bets with each other. Mm -hmm. And then the people who end up losing sats will get ruthlessly made fun of by the people who gain sats for the whole bear market. All day long. Come on, man, double or nothing. Double or nothing, man. Hey, I hear Trump might be taking over this month or something. So, uh, yeah, let's throw an oracle up. Maybe I will. <laughs> Alrighty. Let's see. Next one. Kansas proposes a PM legal tender law. Precious metals. All right. Why on earth would I want to talk about this? Well, I think this is fun. Kansas is not the first place to uh, propose such a law. So the idea here is that uh, any given coin issued by the US government, whether they're the ones you and I are used to, or whether they happen to be gold or silver coins, uh, would be made and designated as legal tender, uh, which means you could denominate contracts in them, you could pay your taxes in them, all that sort of thing. Uh, I like bringing this up. Kansas is not the first state to do this, by the way. Uh, evidently, Utah did this in 2011, and Wyoming and Oklahoma have, have since done similar things. I think it's super interesting to watch states push back on what money is, define what money is, and I think these are prototypical to eventual things that we'll want to talk about as a community to get Bitcoin recognized as a legal tender at some point. Not Today, probably not tomorrow, but someday we're going to want to think about this sort of thing. Yep. 
I mean, that that's like exactly where my head went to. It's just any kind of movement to recognize non-US dollar anything as legal tender like that, like, let's roll. Because you do that, five years, we're talking about just rolling Bitcoin into that category. Yep. And it's great. They're the fourth one to do it. Um, for some reason, I thought Nevada was in that group. I don't know where they're at exactly on that. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It starts small, but as you can tell, it is, it's slowly rolling around here uh, around Colorado. Maybe Colorado will do it. And, you know, I know of other things that we've kind of done on a state just recently as a nation and has a, a little, uh, you know, snowball has rolled downhill and turned into a big snowball. So hopefully this gets through and uh, one more state is added to this list. Whoop. And now, what's this? A window is closed? We can't see inside that room anymore? What's going on in there? Well, how does, what's the saying? A, a window closes and a door opens or something? Um, this is really hard to describe, but what happened was a, a series called M2 has uh, been discontinued at the Fed. So... There are a lot of ways that we talk about base money. And uh, I invite you to do a search on Wikipedia for monetary base, and it'll describe to you the ways the base money is talked about. But it usually starts with notes and coins uh, and then goes on to things like demand deposits, like checking accounts uh, at one point. Um, let's see, I don't think money market was in M1. Uh, I think that was in M2. And then savings accounts, I believe, come in in M2. Uh, and then at, at one point, we published a figure uh, called M3, which was yet more money. And M3 was discontinued some time ago. Evidently, now they've decided to discontinue M2. Uh, they have a new series called M2SL. You know, it's better, it's faster. Um, there's... I, I would invite people to go and read about it. Uh, the composition has changed, whether they're using seasonally adjust data, adjusted data or not. Uh, and then very confusingly, kind of what goes into M2, that mix has changed a little bit. Uh, there, yeah, I am not gonna be able to summarize this well. And, and I apologize, some of it is because it's, uh, it's hard to read. You have failed the listeners. All right, I'm trying it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read and then I'll try to explain. Before May 2020, M2 consisted of M1 plus savings deposits, including money market deposits, small de denomination time deposits, which would be C uh, certificates of deposit under 100 grand, and oh, less IRA and KEO balances, which are tax advantaged accounts and balances in retail money market funds, less IRA and Keo balances. Okay, so that's what it used to be. Now, M2 consists of M1 plus small denomination time accounts, CDs under 100 grand, balances in retail money market funds, less IRA and Keo stuff, and seasonally adjusted M2 is constructed by summing savings deposits, small denomination, time deposits and retail money market funds, each seasonally adjusted separately and adding the results to seasonally adjusted in one. So I think they used to add the raw numbers together every week and then um, seasonally adjust that raw number and uh, versus, well, seasonal adjustment usually means you're taking it against uh, some average that says, okay, we know it's busier in summer than winter, so we're going to weight summer lower and we're going to weight winter higher to try to get a flatter line, a number across all of it that makes better sense all year. Uh, so there's a little statistical magic going on. For whatever reason, these guys have decided they want to do the seasonal adjustment by item separately and then bring all those adjusted numbers together. And usually the skeptical would say, well, that makes it easier for them to play with individual items and how they then hit the pool. Yeah. So like to me, this just 
like they just want less transparency around what's going on with the money supply and more room to fudge things to paint a rosier picture so markets don't freak out if <clears throat> something were to happen like the printer get left on all night yeah and honestly anytime they take raw numbers away from you so you can't even check their math i question it mm -hmm. your move fed all right let's see Next round, evolving past him too. Hmm. So this is actually super neato. Um, Digital Garage, um, who for the most part in this space has been doing um, at least public facing um, a lot of their research and building um, on DLCs. Um, they're one of the players Shirt Bits has been talking to um, the most, I think, as far as specking that out, are now looking at bonds. Um, so Digital Garage, in partnership with uh, Daiwa Securities Group, um, as well as one of their subsidiaries, uh, Daiwa Food and Agriculture Company, um, which is pretty much, uh, it looks like a tech company company. Um, looking to improve productivity in different sectors of agriculture to issue um, a proof of concept for blockchain based corporate bonds. Um, and they pretty much used the um, asset management platform AMP on Liquid. It's kind of the, the two of two um, multi-sig you can issue securities and such into, but have the issuer be one of the signers so they can still enforce um, restrictions on who can own it, um, KYC and things like that, um, with the intention of linking that to um, digital coins um, is the way they frame it on Liquid to pay out things like the interest on the bond, um, accept payment for the bond in, um, pay out the bond in, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, the Daiwa Food and Agriculture bond even comes with um, apparently some special um, benefits to investors on redemption in the terms of like agricultural deliveries. Um, so yeah, um, Daiwa um, as of 2015, as you, you said, was almost $200 billion um, assets under management. Yep. Yeah, that's no little minnow. So it's like a, it's a major Japanese investing company um, actually looking at corporate bonds on liquid. Yeah, Daiwa is one of these Japanese conglomerates that touches everything. And uh, in this case, it looks like their securities division has stepped up to the blockchain T and decided to issue a test bond. Um, or a couple of test bonds. The securities division is issuing one and then Daiwa Foods is issuing one. They're not for long. I think you just cut out. Doing. There. Oh, uh, they're smaller bond offerings. I think it was 10 million yen and 1 million yen. So divide by a thousand to get to real money-ish. And uh, they're not big, but they're there to be proof of concept. And what they're showing is a next generation blockchain based bond market running on liquid in this case. So these these guys and I highly recommend uh, searching for this if you're interested. There's a couple of pictures uh, explaining the various flows in this uh, with the announcement are showing that you can issue a bond on a blockchain you can pay interest on a bond on a blockchain and i assume you can potentially redeem on to get your principal back on a blockchain and these are exactly the places that we'd like to be able to go in the future so congrats thanks for doing it yep i mean th this is like some foundational stuff i mean like i i look at this and then i look around at all the clownish nonsense on eth with the ICOs and fractal DeFi potato tossing. And it's just like, it, fuck the clowns. This is the kind of shit that is going to actually get adopted in 10 years. This can actually scale. This won't just randomly have a bug go, oops, I'm sorry. Everything in the multi-sig is just gone forever. <laughs> This is a billion dollar, well, a hundred billion dollar scale company laying the rails 
for the next 100 years, perhaps. We'll see where it goes. All right, last one of the day. This is actually kind of uh, interesting for just a small um, <laughs> little reason at the end. But um, NVIDIA in their earnings report estimate that 100 to $300 million is kind of what they've pulled in terms of people buying graphics cards for crypto mining. And so with a revenue of $5 billion um, for last quarter last year, that'd be 2 to 6% of their total revenue stream. Um, so eh, enough to stress things, um, which is evident by the fact that um, apparently they have taken step further. Um, last cycle, what they were doing was selling less efficient cards for cheaper to miners, hoping that they would leave the good ones alone for the gamers. Um, didn't work out until supplies left those as the only option. This time around, um, they're including firmware on their graphics cards to throttle the efficiency if it detects that it is mining for Ethereum. Um, to pretty much try to, once again, for the third market cycle in a row, to try to keep graphics cards on the shelves for gamers. And now they're planning on going the exact opposite route last time to cater to the mining crowd um, and trying to make more optimized cards for miners. Um, and they're, they're pretty much fumbling around here trying to, one, figure out how much of the market demand is miners versus gamers, and two, navigate this third market cycle where this happened without pissing off all the gamers and alienating their main stable customer base. <laughs> it's just like, this is so funny. It's like three market cycles, and they still haven't been able to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard this talked about in a couple of different ways, and it's not clear to me whether their announcement was they're going to change firmware on the card itself or whether they're going to change drivers. I've, I've heard it referred to both ways. If it's drivers, of course, you can run old ones. If it's firmware, sure, you can flash it, but you know that has its own risks. Um, to me, this is NVIDIA announcing a higher profit margin category for themselves saying that miners if you really want to use our cards to make all this money you're going to get a pay us for it because i just have to imagine those cmps the only reason to make those is to sell them at a premium but the the trick though is they have to meet a higher efficiency level otherwise Nope, I'm sorry. I'm going to go buy this card that that pissed off gamer um, gave me murder eyes when I got to the shelf first instead because it works better and it's cheaper. Right. And anybody who's mining at scale, if you can flash alternative firmwares on the earlier on the consumer side of cards, we'll figure out how to do that. So I'm not quite sure who they're attacking here, but. To some extent, they're attacking their gamer customer base who now don't get to run their card when they're not gaming to make nearly as much from uh, mining shit coins. That's like the funniest thing about this. They're like fumbling back and forth between like catering to gamers, catering to miners, not pissing miners off, not pissing gamers off. And they're just ping ponging back and forth, ultimately pissing everybody off. <laughs> Nobody likes to notice that whoever's making your favorite product is messing with you. So, yeah, NVIDIA, not a good look. Mm -hmm. All righty, though. I do believe that is it for the day. It is silly meme time. Come on. Bring Give me a meme. A meme? Silly final <laughs> thought? Anything? Serious comment? Come on, you, you gotta. You gotta. It's part of the format. Yep. I, uh... Yet again, have not done my homework for the week. Uh, let's see. Why don't you go first? And... Sorry, that dab I snuck in mid-recording. It just blanked it. Yeah. Cash this corrupted. Is a, this is an interesting week, guys. Um, I've heard that if we close it at 43, we'd have a, a red $13,000 candle this week or something like that. 
Um, you remember when Bitcoins were worth $13,000, guys? You know, that was, that was a good time back then. A couple of, you know, years worth of months ago, it feels like. So, you know, hodl strong. I personally hope for a nice 30, say 9K Bitcoin price on Monday so I can buy a little bit more. Um, I'm sure you guys will disappoint me and put it back up to the moon. So, you know, hodl hard in that regard. Uh, as far as where the news is at, I'm, I mean, I'm trying, trying to get somewhere. I'm just, I don't know, I'm distracted like everybody else. I'm not even sure if this Bitcoin chart is showing me a verifiable price. Well, I just got one. So here's my final thought. It's a way you can have fun. So Shinobi today got to troll the no-coiner about how he didn't buy the dip yet again, even though he pays very close attention to things. And so what Shinobi did was he bought the dip. And then he took memes making fun of no coiners to generate a key on an open dime with which he put the Bitcoin that he bought the dip with. Think of all the inventive ways that you can secure your Bitcoin. Just have fun with it. Yeah, I, I might know the no coiner you're talking about. You know, here's, here's another thought. Everybody, it's, it's kind of fun to play with your friends with regards to this, especially the no coiners. Uh, that particular no corner, I believe he has a cost basis of $30,000 for deciding not to invest. And he has that because I gave it to him. You know, he, uh, he made a little fortune, built a little kingdom on GME stock and, you know, said, well, what are you going to do with all your winnings guy? And, uh, you know, he hemmed and hawed a little bit. And, uh, I said, okay, here's your cost basis, no matter what you do. And I hope you go and kill it with all of your winnings here, buddy. You know, your cost basis on Bitcoin is 30K. So just benchmark to that and go kill it out there. And, you know, it was looking kind of sad for him at the time we were up in the 50s because he was really blown out. But, you know, now we're back down in the 40s. He's, he's only down, you know, one third on that. So, you know, just... Give your friends a cost basis if they really need it, because it's kind of nice to be able to refer back to and say, hey, remember when you didn't buy coin for 30 grand? Yeah, that was a pretty fun day, wasn't it? Sometimes it takes pain to learn. It does. But, yep. On that note, catch you later, punks. Hope you enjoyed. Don't be like the no-coiner. Buy the dip. Buy the fucking dip. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>